And we are live, at least I assume we are. Demetrius in the chat just said live, in which case greetings and salutations, beautiful beans, and welcome to a Friday interview. Yes, we swapped everything around today. So Friday is the interview, Saturday is the cow. And of course, yesterday we did uh, community news. Of course, we have to see today, Peter. Peter, how are you doing? I'm doing wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited to have you here because Peter is the master of randomness, people. I'm gonna explain that in a little uh, in a little minute. But first, Peter, I have committed an egregious error in an interviewer. Do you know what I forgot to do? I've got to ask that? you how to pronounce your surname. Oh yeah, I I mean I don't know. Um I <laughs> the, the, the first the first Tchaikovsky in Canada was like a stowaway on a boat who didn't speak English in like in 1902. That's that's the story, one of the stories that I've heard. Um awesome. that is quite possibly misremembered. So um we don't say it how any Polish person would say it now, and we're saying it wrong as a family. So I'm not gonna correct anyone. I say I say Tchaikovsky. Tchaikovsky, awesome. Yeah. Peter Tchaikovsky is a Renaissance man because he's a man who does many things, as we were just talking. He's a writer, an editor, an illustrator, a creator. His poetry and short fiction has appeared everywhere that they print stuff, numerous magazines and collections, and his web comic rock paper cynic, love the name by the way, is an Thank online <laughs> sensation that won Best Graphic Novel Awards in 2014 and 2018, but that is not all. As I said, he's the master of randomness and he is the creator of the Story Engine deck and the recent Deck of Worlds, which is now in Kickstarter. What is a Story Engine deck and how does it drive my story, Peter? Um, well, it's a deck of cards for creating your own story prompts. So it gives that nice bit of like randomization where you're looking for something that, that's going to take you a little bit out of your comfort zone, that's going to force you to, to think outside of the normal grooves you think in when you're writing. Um, and also that gives it an element of play. Um, Cause there's like, when you sit down with your creative time, especially if you're really busy, you feel this like weird pressure to like create something that's gonna be, that you can show someone else or that you can publish somewhere. And it's nice to just sometimes think of it as a game, bring the spirit of play and creativity back to it and, uh, and have fun with it. Um, so it gives you that bit of randomness, but then it also lets you make a lot of meaningful choices because every card has multiple options for how you're going to build your prompt. And it kind of works like Lego where you stack different cards on top of each other to create a simple prompt or a complex prompt or however, whatever kind of prompt you need in that moment. Um, yeah, so it's a nice combination of like random, but also intentional and chosen that, uh, that helps a lot of people jumpstart their creative process. That's really That's, cool. Uh, now, yeah. You have one in front of you right now, don't you? Can I you do indeed. There's a little show. The yeah, reason I so. ask is because we're raffling one of these off right now. Oh, oh. yeah. Exclamation point raffle to take part in that. Uh, can you give us the strip tease of the story engine, please? Yeah, of course. Here, I'll do a quick, a quick little demo thing. So yeah, it comes in this wonderful little treasure chest box, um, which opens here and fancy and a little magnet latch. And then this folds down to a little play surface. And uh, there are five types of cards, which I'll really quickly go through. Um, but basically, you have got uh, agent cards. And agents are different characters in your story. And you rotate the card to activate different cues. Um, and then you connect an agent to an engine card, which is a motivation that they might have, something that they want. Um, and they might want, for example, an anchor card, which is a location or an object um, of interest. And uh, that will be paired with a conflict card, which is the consequence of getting what you want, or perhaps the price you might have to pay to get what you want. And then we have a deck of aspect cards, which are basically just really interesting adjectives that you can tuck under agents and anchors to give them more description and texture in life. And it is so easy to like, in like two minutes, you can create a custom prompt about a character who wants something and it's gonna be a problem if they get it or if they try to get it. Um, and it's great for creating like instant NPCs or story hooks or campaign ideas. If you wanna create two factions with different leaders, uh, you just throw two characters up against each other with different wants, often over the same object. You can create like a land dispute or like a fight for a magic artifact. Um, and it's just really quickly quick and easy and fun. And it's also good for like learning what the bones of a story are and how you can fit those bones together in different ways to create different types of, different types of story shapes. So yeah, that'll be, that, that can be yours. That is very, very cool. Thank you so much for showing us. Anyone who is familiar with Guy, that's the great GM's uh, sort of story formula, someone wants something uh, by a time and is having trouble getting it because of something. This is all of the answers in card form to all of those questions, right? All of those sort of 
uh, nebulous something words. Yeah. This is full of prompts to answer those kinds of things. Uh, and you've just made a world building one as well, but we're going to be talking more about that later. Exclamation yeah. point raffle to get um, get a chance to get your little mitties on the story engine deck. Very exciting. So you do randomness. We have just launched our random generators. That's which so are, exciting. Course, not only ours, <laughs> but our communities as well. I cannot wait to see what comes out of this. I'm so excited. So I thought today would be a great day to talk about randomness and the role of randomness within creativity, which is really my first question. How can randomness help us? What is the role of randomness in creativity? I think randomness is a really good delivery mechanism for um, structure or or for something that's going to take you outside of your comfort zone. Um, one of my favorite like sentences I've ever heard about as a creative, like trying to make sure that you're not always going to the same, um, to hit the same notes every time is from like Tom Waits. He, he used to say that he would, uh, I think he'd break his fingers. He said he would break his fingers between albums because he's, you know, like he plays a lot of instruments, but he's a pianist and guitar player. And he described fingers as like dogs that love to go smell the same corners every time. So you have to break your fingers between every album to like get a different sound or to, to get them from going away to their familiar places. And I think that randomness in creating prompts or giving yourself a place to start from forces you to take a different route than you'd normally take. I think it's a really good way to do that uh, and less violent than breaking your fingers. It's, it's a lot more fun because randomness also introduces like this element of play. Um, and yeah, I think like a really good prompt offers a combination of um, like structure, uh, or something that you didn't choose that you have to that you have to take and find a way to run with kind of like like when you're watching like chopped kitchen like you want to give someone interesting ingredients that, that they're going to have to use and that creates a challenge um, but then you want there to be enough open-endedness or freedom in that prompt that they can like take it and run with it where they want to and I think that randomness is just like such a good delivery mechanism for that because if you don't like the random thing that you rolled up you roll another one. Or I know some some generators let you like kind of pin one aspect of what you've rolled. So like, let's imagine you wrote, you create like a random settlement and you're like, oh, I really like that this settlement um, uh, has like a lot of agriculture and I want to do like an agricultural town, but I'm not so hot on the fact that they're like really warlike. Maybe I'll pin the agriculture element and I'm going to roll again on like their international or their, their uh, diplomacy style and and pick a different element for that so that being able to like have intentionality and choice mixed in with the randomness i think is like a really beautiful combination um and i think that's where creatively people really hit their stride like i know my background as a poet um i i love and hate formal poetry because the structure of it is what makes it such an interesting space to work in um with formal poetry with like say a sonnet where you have like x number of lines but you can choose the Spencerian sonnet or the Shakespearean sonnet, you can choose when you want your turn to happen. There are like elements of it you can customize. Um, you can do blank verse and not, and not have it rhyme if you decide, and that challenges the form of the sonnet. But these are all like intentional choices you can make that let you play with structure and play with this imposed prompt thing. Um, and that's why I like randomness. I like, I like that randomness gives you this huge menu of options for choosing what that imposed structure is or what the element that you have to use in your, uh, in your creativity, um, but it doesn't, it's not like binding. You can, at the end of the day, you can reroll or you can try something else. And I think that that's, that's a really powerful tool to have. And the fact that uh, you were telling me sort of before, before we went live here, that uh, the community can create their own, uh, can, can, can create their own content with the randomizers and build their own randomizing stuff. Like that kind of open-ended tool is just outrageously cool to me. Like that's what, that's what I live for um, is these, is tools that people can you hand, you hand it to them and they can pick it up and do whatever they want with it. Like your intended use for it is this thing, but if they if they can find a way to play, you know, a sonata on a hammer, you're not gonna stop them. That's, that, why would you? <laughs> that's, that's amazing. Yeah, exactly. I love what you said about um, how randomness can help break us out of our own patterns, because I think a lot of us as creatives, if we take a hard look at our work, we'll see recurring elements that are intentional, and we'll see recurring elements that are not intentional. And I think it's such a nice point. I, I love that. And I think that that is, that is definitely a power of, of randomness within creativity um, that I identify with personally. Um, do you use random generators yourself? Yeah, um, yeah, I do. I uh, I really like, um, like one of the things that I tried to do with the Story Engine deck and the Deck of Worlds um, is like create tools that I actually want to use. Um, and the Deck of Worlds in particular has been something where uh, 
it's I've just enjoyed playing with it so much. It's been like a fun little sandbox for me that um, that I do use that for for setting generation and not even for settings that I plan to use for anything. Like I just like doing it as a fun, like literally just as an activity that kind of like building castles in the sand in like an intertidal zone. Like I know that once these cards go back in the deck, this particular combination, that the the, the alchemy of this combination of prompts is going to be lost. And that's fine because I, I'm having so much fun with just the, the play of it. Um, and uh Actually, going back to like the thing where you can like pin one element and then randomize the rest or whatever, that's actually how I ended up choosing the, the color scheme for the deck of worlds. I'm going to pull hey. it out only, only to sort of like demonstrate. I was trying to find a color combination and I found a color randomizer that lets you spin a wheel and then you can lock certain colors in and you can, I think there was a slider for choosing, I want this to try and intentionally pair things that work well with these, or you can just keep it full random, in which case you never know what you're going to get. Um, and, uh, and cause I, I had, I'd already used up like my five favorite colors on the story engine deck. And I wanted to have colors that didn't, that didn't match it too, too closely and would be like visually different, but yeah, I ended up using a color randomizer, believe it or not, to come up with these where I could like, as I found colors I liked and combinations that I liked, and I could visualize all of my choices at the same time, I'd pin ones and then randomize the next one and pin one and randomize the next one. And then at the end, you know, you do some customization tweaks or whatever, but, um, yeah, I uh, when especially when you have, and this is one of the things I love about about World Anvil, when you have visualization tools, when you have ways of seeing how you've organized your choices and being able to go back to them and, and pull up the ones that you want when they're relevant and background them when they're not relevant, is just so helpful. <laughs> it's so helpful because for a world builder, like, um, it, it's kind of like with uh, I, I can't remember which version of Spider Man needs to have like the limiting goggles because there's too much input. Um, mm. uh, and and uh, it's impossible to focus on one thing when you have like hypertuned senses. I think world builders are sensitive to a lot of different stimuli and inspirations, and there's so much to consider when you're building a world because there are so many aspects to the world. Um, and I think that uh, having tools that let you decide, okay, right now I want my heads up display to show me visual moving threats. Now I want infrared. Now I want the fact that you can put these layers on and see the world through different lenses uh, is so, so helpful. And so, yeah, I think that organizing information as a world builder is as important as thinking of things to, to put into your organization um and uh, and visual tools for that i think are so so helpful which is not that, the question you asked but <laughs> that's a thought i had <laughs> <laughs> that's okay i mean we're here to have an interesting conversation first um and uh, that actually brings me to mention folks in the chat i see some questions have already come in but if you do have questions for peter please do throw those into the chat use that flaming anvil underneath the chat window and you can redeem a single anvil point which you gain just by hanging out with us to uh, ask a question we'll be answering those at the end of the stream what you just said is fantastic because uh you know talking all of sort of hyper focus and and sort of the spread and and the sort of dispersal that we sometimes feel ourselves in as world builders where we're like must build everything um is is there such a thing as too random from a random generator uh so what i'm asking really is you have a world you have a vision for your world how can you stay true to that with random generators how can you make sure that what you're creating actually fits within your your meta right your meta information of of what you want your world to be I, I think there are a few ways to do this, but I, to me, the most reliable and like kind of my my design philosophy as a designer of creative tools is to always leave room for the writer or the world builder or the storyteller in the prompt. Um, like some of my early drafts of the story engine deck um, were uh, like almost too tight. Like they were too mm -hmm. focused on like providing a fully fledged prompt and like at that point, there's no story left to explore or discover because it's all already there. Um, and with randomization, I think that however you structure your randomization, however you build your tool, it is really important to leave room for the storyteller to make choices and to find ways to use them. Because like the elasticity of the human brain is incredible. Uh, the ability of people to create patterns in, between different points that you, different data points you give them or different prompts you give them is incredible. Um, uh, if you give people like four random words, they'll they'll build a story out of it. They 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 will find a way to do it. Um, and uh, so I think that as long as your randomization tool leaves room for the storyteller to make choices about how these fit together, they'll find a way to connect those patterns. That's that's something the brain's naturally going to do. And kind of like. The, the hoodwink of the story engine deck and the deck of worlds is that it, it they're very simple, very simple design. Um, really what it's designed to do is like get, get your brain already jumping to make those connections before you realize that it's doing it. So that, that instinct that second guesses those choices um, doesn't have a chance to activate because you're already 
by the time you it, 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 it's whispering the like, is this idea good enough or is this what I should be creating? You've already kind of created something and you're already kind of interested in it. Yeah. Um, and uh, with randomization tools, I think as long as you give people a, that element of play and be the element to, to, to either edit their choices um, or, uh, or connect them in a way that is meaningful to them, then mm. you're going to automatically find patterns in the chaos. Um, otherwise, yeah, you could end up with like just a, a random assortment of completely unconnected things. But as long as there's room for the storyteller to, to make choices or to think about how the choices they've made connect, um, I think that you're going to you're going to do you're going to have end up with a, a, a good result or at least a result that there's something to work with. Yeah, that makes sense. Interesting. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, uh, Orson Scott Card, who I hesitate to talk about because he was kind of yeah. a butthole, but he yeah. had very interesting ideas very about writing, about. unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, kind of a Wagner syndrome there where you're like, oh, yeah. interesting music. Oh, horrible person. Yeah. Um, yeah. But Orson Scott Card talks about binning your first idea because the first idea is the one that you would always reach for. So you should bin that, that's that's the obvious idea. You should mm -hmm. dig deeper. Do you think that random generators can be used like that? Do you think that's a helpful way to approach random generators? I mean, I think that, I think I think it's definitely a helpful perspective to have. And I think that the choice to like, to bin the first idea or not is a little bit context driven. Like I am, I am, uh, I, I don't, I've done a tiny bit of improv. I'm not good at it. It's, I, I'm not an expert in it, but it's something that I pay attention to because it's a really interesting space for storytelling. And I also think that it's a really cool space for learning skills about like how to share a scene um, and uh, how to build something with somebody else collaboratively. And those are all really cool creative tools so that, I, that I've tried to like learn more about. But with improv, you, you, the, the goal is not to overthink your choices. Um, and I think that for, the, for embracing the play instinct, um, giving yourself permission to run with a bad first thought is totally fine. Um, and there's a there's definitely a time where you do the edit and you're like, hey, that first thought wasn't a good one, or that first thought was problematic, or that first thought there's there's something deeper that I can go to, but that was I wouldn't have gotten to that deeper point unless I used that first thought as a bridge. So I definitely think that there's there's value in the first thought and there's value in learning how to have a relationship with it where you can understand where you're, you're, you're not so precious of, about it that you're happy to discard it if it's in the way, but that you're not going to overthink it if you decide, you know what, I am going to run with that. Like, there's a reason that dragons continue to be on the covers of bestsellers. We've seen a thousand dragons, but there's still something about it that's really powerful. And if your first thought is like, jump on a dragon, yeah, then go for it. Because it like there's a reason that it's powerful. There's something about, about this style of mythical beast and the primordial nature of fire and and all that that's that's fascinating a, a human obsession with flight like all of this is stuff that that goes into the dragon that makes it a really powerful thing and i i wouldn't want anyone to like not write about dragons because they feel like it's already been done that said i think there is so much value in in the edit um and i think that the creative process and the editing process um have areas of overlap but it helps to think of them as, as separate processes with separate goals um and if you edit while you're writing i think you could miss out on a lot of opportunities that, that the creativity would have given you. But if you don't edit after your writing, then you're going to have a lot of kind of sloppy drafts where um, the person's not gonna have the best first experience with your work that they could. Um, so to Orson Scott Card, um, you know, intelligent butthole with, with some helpful things that he said, um, I, I would say, yeah, I think it's, it's really important to, to um, know when you're when you just reached for the the very comfortable ideas that you're used to using for your first draft, um, and to give yourself tools that challenge you to reach for, not for the first thing in the top drawer, but to like go into those drawers that you don't open often enough to pull out a different ingredient that you otherwise might not use, and that really could um, like uh, elevate the thing that you're creating. Um, yeah. yeah. So yeah, absolutely. Con con context driven would be my answer. How how how, how do you feel about that? I, I think you're absolutely right. I think it also depends on who you are and how experienced you are, because often often you can tell, like if I'm writing a, a short story, if I'm, I'm working on a, a novel concept and I, I look at something and I'm like, this seems oddly familiar. And I look at it a little bit more carefully. I'm like, ah, I've used that in a previous novel slash story slash idea I had, yeah. right. I might want to rethink this, either this one or that one, to see if this is really the idea that I want. Is this really the idea that's going to make this shine? Or could I push myself? Could I, could I explore a different route? Could I explore something that might give me more in terms of characterization, more in terms of world exploration, just something else, just to see what that looks like? And I think yeah. that if you're, if you're more experienced, you start to recognize the patterns in your own work. I think if you're less experienced, 
you should make sure that you don't give yourself too many traumas. That's kind of how yeah. I feel about that. Like, yeah. be, feel, feel free to play. I think, uh, so we do this, this uh, summer camp challenge every single July. We, we, we're in the fourth year now, which is very exciting. It's our longest running challenge. Um, and uh, during this challenge, we challenge our community to answer well, uh, world building props, which they have not seen yet. Um, and there's a lot of people who ask us, is this okay? Is, is my answer okay? Am I, am I answering the question correctly? And I think that's the other danger, right? You start to second guess yourself and you start to worry that you're not, you're not doing it right. And I think that if you have a tendency towards that, just, just, just give yourself the ability to, to play, to be creative, to explore. Um, and you know what? You can always twist it on its head later. You can say, yes, 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 subvert. And yes, that's, that's yes. another thing that's okay to do, to say, yes, I am going to have dragons. And yes, they are going to fly, but also they're going to have an, an extra extravagant culture around tea ceremonies. Because I think that's cool and I've subverted dragons. dragons. You've got me hooked. I, I want to read the tea dragon book now. Dragons with tea. Yeah. See, we, we need this to happen. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Do you see what I mean? So you can you can have your cake and eat it too, right? You can yeah. you can go with your first idea and as you said, edit and subvert and find ways to realize it in an unexpected way. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think that's also the beauty of randomness is that you can go back to your random generator and say, all right, I have this. I've used this before. What have you got for me, random generator? How can yeah. I make this crazy? Um, yeah. And I think that they they are tools that can keep giving in different parts of the creative process as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. Like not and just at the beginning. Yeah, yeah. And thinking of them as yeah, as like tools in the toolkit, um, where you can combine them in different ways. Like there's creativity in even just how you pair different generation tools. Um, there's there's creativity on when you decide to bring it into the process. So uh, I think that like learning to use these tools and recognize the different types of utility in them is is really important. And and I love having a full toolbox. Like I, one thing I've noticed, my, my, uh, my mom recently got into collage uh, and has been doing some like really cool collages and she's been taking a course in it and like talking to me about how uh, um, collage artists will have like one of the most important things for them is having a really rich library of media that they can pull from. Yeah. Like drawers and drawers and drawers organized in different ways for like images that are largely colored blue or red or pink or um, images that have like a high fashion feel or like there's so many ways they can categorize it and being able to go through their their boxes of tools to pull on these things that they can create things out of is really important to them. And more and more I'm recognizing that I kind of do that too. Like last year when I realized I was gonna do a pulp fiction expansion for uh, uh, the story engine deck, I just started like downloading every single public domain pulp magazine I could find. Cause I just wanted to have like a really like, like a bird building a nest. Like I just want to have as many different things I could to build it out of. Um, and I, and I ended up with like a huge folder of, and I only used like 5% of it, but being able to edit and choose from a bigger library. And again, this is the same thing for how you build random generators, but having a big library to choose from is really essential. And I think that treating those randomizers as tools in your, in your library as, as um, different materials you can draw on is so helpful. Um, and yeah, that's why I think that like, it's always worth like taking 10, 20 minutes to play with a new tool, learn it and decide like, hey, where do I think this might fit into my process or when might I use this? Um, Cause you never know when you're gonna want it and being able to find it when you do eventually need it down the road or when like, oh, this is exactly what I would want this for is um, uh, that's just like, it, it's, it's so good for maintaining your creativity flow state when you can just like grab the tool you need and you know where it is. Yeah, absolutely. And um, it also, it, it gives you it gives you what you need when you need it, essentially, right? Whatever yeah. that is and whenever that is. And sometimes it won't work and then you put it down and try something else. Yeah, um, yeah. Like mistakes when you make them in the creative process are, are totally non-binding. Like you can always you can always hit the undo key. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There is always another draft if you need it. Yeah. Um, the chat is now world building tea dragons. Uh, the kettle is an armor left over from eating the adventurers, says Amelie. Um, oh, love it. Love that. <laughs> the dragon breath to heat the tea is overkill says uh, Tandefel, like using a volcano to get warm. So there's a, there's a lot of discussion here about how exactly tea dragons would work, but I freaking yeah. love it. Although while, while we're building this, using a volcano to get warmer, I don't see any reason why the tea dragons don't use like volcanoes as hot tubs. Yeah, um, they totally I would. would. I would yeah. like to add that to our, our lore, if I might. I'd, I'd like yeah, to, yeah, to, take, to take that pitch that I think was intended to be ridiculous. And, and I think, no, there's, let's make that valid. <laughs> yeah, forget geothermal springs. They lounge yeah. in lava. Uh, yeah. I think that can happen. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, let's make that happen. And, All right, and, guys, and they, we've made a thing. Sip, and they sip their tea and they gossip. 
I love that. I freaking love it. Yeah. <laughs> so um, you can start, you can use gen, uh, random generators at any point in the process as we, as we discussed. Um, how far do you think you should go with them? Is there a point at which you say we should put the random generator aside? If you're making a new world, how many things should be generated by a random generator and uh, where should you stop? Um, I mean, I think the where should you stop is going to be a pretty, a pretty personal thing. But like, I would say that like, uh, if you build something entirely out of random generators, it's like trying to run a restaurant on the chopped kitchen model. Like chopped kitchen is fun to watch. It's a great concept. Um, and, and just in case people don't know, it is a, a cooking game show where uh, professional chefs are given like a mystery basket of, of random ingredients and they have to mm. create a meal out of them. Um, but I, I would not want to go eat at that restaurant necessarily, because to me, that's not a model for getting like the best meal. It's a model for getting the most interesting meal from a creative perspective from a chef who's being pushed to their limits. Um, but I think it'd be cool if a menu involves things that the chef was experimenting with, involved things where they were like, hey, right now, the random generator of crops and seasons has given me a ton of water chestnuts, and I'm going to do a meal based on that as the ingredient anchor. That is a form of, you know, it, not necessarily randomization because the world follows predictable patterns about what's in season. But again, it's an imposed ingredient given to you from outside that you're going to try and build a creative product around, and that product is a meal. So I think that um, the sweet spot is um, giving, definitely letting yourself, especially during the idea generation phase, just like swing for the fences, create a lot of fun stuff, and build up the library of the final elements you're going to put into your world. And then when, um, when it comes time to like share that world with someone, that's when I'd start doing the editing process. And the other thing that I talk about a lot is the fact that like creativity or writing and publishing are, there's there's almost no overlap on the Venn diagram for me for that. I think it, it's much healthier and more and, and more beneficial to the creative process and to expectations about publishing to treat those as unrelated processes, writing, publishing, and then editing I think is the circle that connects them where you decide how much of the final edit is going to make concessions to make this world um, popular with a lot of people or accessible to the people who I want it to be accessible to um, or easy to market and pitch. Like those are all decisions that are very personal decisions that creators make before the other people experience something they've created. Um, and I don't just mean publishing, like like putting your world on like DMs Guild. I mean, like even just like inviting friends in to play it, that is a form of publishing. That's a form of taking something that was private to you and making it public and editing is kind of the bridge there. And editing, I think is where you make those decisions about how much of the randomizations can end up in the final thing. And that's where I would say like, I always overcreate, like I always generate um, two to 10 times more ideas than I need for the thing. Um, and then I like to take that as a huge library of things to collage. And then I, I pair them and create the final thing out of that. So um, I would say like go whole hog on randomization early, like have fun with it, create as much as you want. Um, and especially when you have like these awesome visualization tools like the World Anvil where you can like see all these things you've created um, and it's easy to organize them and grab them and edit them and catalog them, amazing, like do that. And then when it comes time for the edit, think about who you're creating for and think about the best choices you have available to, to hit the goals that you want when this thing becomes public. Um, and if that is, if your goal is to challenge people's perspectives on colonialism, then you'll be able to edit the choices that you've made in an intelligent way to achieve that goal. If your goal is to create a politics-free fun romp, um, and I, I'm someone who doesn't believe that anything's ever truly politics-free. I think that trying to create a politics-free space is in itself making a political choice to, to deprioritize certain struggles, but that's not the question you asked. <laughs> um, uh, uh, but if your goal is just to make like a fun romp space, then then make a fun romp space and you'll be able to make that editorial decision because of the, the wealth of uh, options you have because of the randomization. So go whole hog early, make intelligent choices during the editing process. And then when you push to publish, I think you'll have been able to create focus choices that like fit the goal that you have with the world you've created or the story you've created or whatever it is that you want to share with people. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we on World Anvil have what we call the world meta so this is your sort of your blueprint, your DNA of what your world is supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And I think that is the reference tool for those of you in the chat who are sitting there thinking, but how do I do this? That is your reference tool, right? That's the thing where you sit down and say, okay, I am trying to make a world that is like this, or this is the flavor I want, or this is this is my, my motivation, this is my goal. Mm -hmm. And that's the, the yardstick that you edit by, or meter stick or whatever, whatever measurements you're using. Um, yeah. 
that's that's what you can reference and that's that's where you can find and again you don't need to treat that slavishly because your ideas may have changed through the creative process you may have struck upon something that is more interesting or more interesting to you than your original concept that's okay update your meta yeah because uh-huh. yeah. then I you'll know where the project is going yeah yeah i absolutely love that as a tool like i think in in like writer's terms like the boil down is often the term that's used for like when at the end of the day if you boiled down the story this is the concentrate that you'd be left with yeah and i hadn't thought about that for world building but i've been playing with um and this is me sort of like i'm now talking about an, about an idea that you just gave me for how to make the deck better nice. um so we're gonna we're gonna do this live um uh, I've been thinking about, because uh, the, the deck of worlds make, works by creating micro settings. So uh, in like five minutes, you can create an individual setting that will have connective tissue to other parts of the world. It might be related through elements of trade or conflict um, or cultural exchange, but it's me- there's meant to be little tie-ins that connect it to neighboring areas. And these separate um, micro settings add up to a world map. And I've been thinking about how you create the word you've, you've given me, thank you for the gift, uh, is meta, um, how you create something that connects them. Um, and the thought that I've been having is uh, there are cards for like creating origins or um, current day attributes or large scale events that are changing things uh, for the future. Um, but it'd be interesting to have like, you could take any of these cards and promote them to a meta status. And this becomes part of the connective tissue for the entire map. So let's imagine you're, cre- you're creating your third setting and this setting is about like, um, mushrooms are really important to this culture. Um, and because it's an open-ended prompt, you decide how it's important. But that could be a meta, like a world where um, mushrooms and understanding of, of fungal networks is really important to how everyone understands the world, but they have competing understandings for, for like which model of, of fungus best explains the world. That's, that's a viable meta. Um, so I mean, that's- just wrote Star Trek in the chat. Yeah. Yes, that's actually, yeah. that's, that's Star Trek Discovery with the mycelial yeah. network, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So I think, thank thank you. This is, uh, I promise not to immediately like run off the stream midstream to write this down, but that's, I've been, I've been trying to think about how to create like an overarching world theme um, as part of the guidebook. And I think that you just gave it to me. So thank you. Have you read Collaborative World Building by Trent Hergenrader? Uh, I have not. It is glorious. It goes into a lot of detail about how you can create meta and what should be in there. I'll try and hook you up with Trent if you want afterwards. He also has a series of cards, which is wonderful for world building, um, which goes through different sort of essentially meta things, right? So it goes through different areas. We'll talk about this afterwards because I think this would be really useful for you. But um, yeah, it's great. I think it would be something that's very, very useful and we can hook you up with Trent if you want. He's lovely. He's- uh, That'd be amazing. Um, he's a professor of world building. Yeah. Also a world ample <laughs> user. I, I saw him on your uh, your previous guests list and I was yeah. like, oh, that is so, co- I didn't know that was a job. No one told me that was a job. <laughs> I know, <laughs> Thank you. right? I would love that. I would love that. <laughs> yeah, so um, we can make that happen. Um, well, uh, we've talked a little bit about this already, but um, tropey thinking and random generators. We tend to see you, see, you see something that says, create a short species in your world that is stocky and has beards. And our mm-hmm. brain goes one place, we go Tolkienian dwarves, we cannot mm-hmm. help ourselves. What are some, what are some, I, that was very Dutch, I almost said, what are some advices? Sorry, <laughs> what are some pieces of advice you can offer for getting around the tropes that lurk within our subconscious? Yeah. Oh, good. I was hoping I'd get a, you, you, you said that sometimes the cats will come and like present to the camera and- uh, Oh, yeah, was, yeah, yeah. There we go. I yeah, got, yeah. I got, we I, we I, like to call this the checklist. periscope tail. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sometimes it becomes a mustache as well. It's very, yeah, it's, uh, oh, yeah. lovely. <laughs> um, right, so uh, I've been distracted by the adorable cat. Tropes which lurk, lurk tropes. in our subconscious. Yeah. yeah. So I, um, as a microfiction writer, I love tropes because microfiction, um, you have so little word count to establish your world and tropes let you download an entire context to the reader's brain because it's, or not even download, the packet's already in their brain. They already yeah. know what a witch is and the social expectations around witches. Um, and uh, and so the moment you say witch, you get to access a huge amount of existing lore in their head already and start with that. So as someone who's trying to compress the narrative, that's brilliant because it gives you a starting point that's already so rich in, in context and expectation. And then it lets you disrupt. 
and that is what I think, um, like, I don't think you have to disrupt every trope. I think you can, if you just want to have dragons, you just want to have elves. I, I don't think anyone should feel pressured to like, here's how my elves are different. Um, I think that it, it certainly, you create more opportunities to excite your reader when you disrupt a trope. But, um, but I would encourage people to like, if you find yourself going to tropes, um, use that as your starting point, not your finishing line. Um, and, uh, and figure out where you want to run with it. And there's so many directions. There's so many ways to do the new takes. Um, uh, so one of the ways that you can do that is like take trope of dwarf and then combine with something else. Like mix ingredients is a great way to, to disrupt tropes. So I like dwarves and I like ants and I'm going to make my dwarves have mossy beards um, and they're very tree-ish. And that way I move away from like the dwarf stone connotation and I move toward something that's more organic in dwarves. And, and sure. there's still something about roots uh, and like the toughness of trees that feels dwarfy. So like there's there's similarity and difference. Um, and uh, I think that that combination of, of something that is accurate and true, but also surprising is kind of the sweet spot for almost all kinds of writing that are meant to acknowledge a tradition and then disrupt it. Like even if you look at how to write a good metaphor, um, uh, one of my writing teachers and mentors uh, in university, uh, Daryl Wetter, always said that like metaphors succeed in a combination of accuracy and surprise. Um, so if you just do a metaphor that's like, it was cold as ice, people aren't, aren't even gonna see the words because they're just gonna see that as a placeholder. It's a, de it's a dead metaphor. Um, but if you say that um, uh, something is cold as, I don't know, the bottom of an ashtray, uh, th that, that is accurate and it's surprising. It's a combination that maybe I haven't heard before. Um, and that is where a metaphor really hits like a sweet spot is it gives someone a new, sensory vocabulary for understanding or describing the world. Um, and uh, I think to go back to the original question, which I think again, I've forgotten. Oops. Oh, tropes, tropes, yeah. You want, you want accuracy and surprise. Uh, so you wanna, you wanna take that trope and do something new with it. You wanna surprise, give something that they recognize, but then give them something surprising about it. Uh, and one of my favorite sort of quotes about, about that, that style of creativity is from, um, he was a Hungarian uh, scientist doctor, Albert St. Georgi. He was the guy who basically first said, like, what if we washed our hands before we did surgery? Oh, yes. Um, and then he stopped all the puerperal fever in yes, his. Yeah, yes. Yeah, he was amazing. Yeah. yeah. And, that and he guy. said that he said that discovery consists of uh, looking at something that everyone's looked at and seeing something that no one's seen. Um, and I'd say that, make that your approach to tropes. Look at something that everyone's looking at and see if you can find something that they haven't seen. And if you can't find something, that doesn't mean you can't use the trope. It still is a viable ingredient. Like I wouldn't not cook with olive oil just because everyone cooks with olive oil. It's a great ingredient, but it's nice if you can do something with it that's gonna elevate it and, and uh, give someone like a new, a new thing to taste. So olive yeah. Olive oil I, with mossy beards. Yeah, yeah, dwarves yes. mossy beards. That's, that's creepy. Take, take, take that and run yeah. with it. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome, we chat. <laughs> yeah, we can add that to the dragon tea verse. I think that uh, I think that'd be a fun ingredient. Um, there is some uh, some comment here about uh, dwarf ants as they yeah. as they shall henceforth or or dwents. I was thinking dwents. as they shall henceforth. Oh, I like be dwents. Yeah, dwents. Yeah, it could work. Right, yeah. it's got legs. Dwents that yeah. play Gwent naturally. Oh yeah, um, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah tents. Yeah, they live in tents. Yeah, yeah, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Until they're in their twents, and then uh, and then all sorts of things happen. <laughs> this is getting very silly, very fast, and I love it. <laughs> yeah, this is the Susian school of world building. If it rhymes, yes. it's in the meta. <laughs> there, there is, there is, there is that saying: if it rhymes, it must be true. Yeah, um, yeah. of course. So, um, let's segue to the deck of worlds, which we have been discussing, and which I know the chat has been pouring over. There's a comment here. I'm looking at the Kickstarter, and one of the cards is known for a distinctive legume and i oh, love yeah. it yeah yeah i actually that was one of the first ones that i drew when i was starting to like take photos of the prompts to show people like hey here's what i've been working on um and what did it turn into oh it was a hallucinogenic bean um oh, yeah. that an art that an artist commune was using magic to like beans. inspire their art yeah magic that beans. is magic, magic beans there you go that's that's a trope but it's been disrupted yeah. because now it's like groovy dude like yeah so I, I uh, yeah, yeah, legumes, leg legumes. And, and again, legumes are so important to like the history of agriculture and agriculture is important to the history of, of uh, human society. And so why not? 
why not encourage people to consider the lagoon, the humble consider lagoon the lagoon. when they're building their lofty work? Yeah, yeah, I like, yeah, I like, exactly. I like that delivery. <laughs> <laughs> not for nothing was I an opera singer. I can say the yeah. word lagoon, lagoon with gravity. <laughs> um, good, very, yeah, sorry, this is, this is just evolving now. Um, so what inspired the creation of the Deck of Worlds? Obviously you'd made the story engine already, uh, and we've talked about where that came from. Deck of Worlds, how come? Well, it was, part of it came from, I was trying to make the story engine do world building and it kind of could, but there was definitely like a gap in, in that, like, cause the, the story engine is really good for building um, like human level stories and you can elevate it to like faction level stories pretty easily, but elevating it to world level stories was hard. You could create like an interesting artifact with it or an interesting like single location, but it was really hard to create connective tissue between it. And then the big thing was it was really hard to create like adjacent areas. You couldn't map with it. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I love mapping, like making maps is just, it's just such a fun activity, even if you're doing it to, 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 to bin it immediately. It's just, it's rewarding in and of itself. Um, so I wanted to try and create something that was more specialized. And then the other thing was that I started working on this kind of like right when quarantine was hitting. I was, I'm in Canada now, but I was living in Scotland at the time. Um, oh, wow. And uh, yeah, I was in, in, in Edinburgh, and um, where my people come from. I I I am um, I any if you ever need to like hire someone in the UK, let me apply for the job just because I so desperately want to go back and get a visa. I was there on the like tier five uh, youth mobility visa that like Commonwealthers just have their government sponsor them, so it's really easy to like go be in the UK for two years for no reason. Yeah. And and my wife and I did that. We were in London for a year and Edinburgh for a year. Nice. And um, good choices, uh, can I just say? Yeah, yeah, they were nice wonderful cities. cities. Yeah, yeah. Um, but Ed we fell in love with Edinburgh and we're like desperate to go back to Scotland. So anyone who has any kind of way that you can smuggle us into Scotland, thank you. Um, uh, but but qu quarantine was like, was hard because I, uh, I, I like going for walks. I like going out and rambling the countryside. Um, I have no Scottish blood in me whatsoever, but I had like a random stranger once in a Tim Hortons, which is a very bit of Canadian bit of world building lore, although there are Tim Hortons in Scotland. Okay, I'm three tangents deep. Hold on. Tim Hortons in Scotland, walking around Scotland. I'm not Scottish, but I have Scottish rambling tendencies. Um, and um, But I, I like to wander. And so the building worlds was actually a really therapeutic way to deal with being contained to a small space and having Boris Johnson tell us that we could only go out once a day, which again, I, full, quarantine was good. I'm, I'm a full supporter of quarantine. Quarantine was also it was hard. hard. And, yeah. yeah, and this is one of the ways that I coped with it was was through world building and then creating tools for like creating these vast imagined spaces that I could go wander in my mind. Um, and that was lovely. I really, really loved doing that. Um, and uh, I, I don't think it's a coincidence that experimenting with, especially one to create like a map, like a whole space that I could explore coincided with a time where, where it was very dangerous to not or not very dangerous but you had to be very careful about how you go out and the the extra layer of anxiety about how you handle the safety of going out makes it a less desirable thing to do um and um uh yeah so the the, the deck of worlds was also very born out of a, a uh, quarantine induced claustrophobia and a child and to like a child of quarantine vandalust i freaking yeah. love it it's oh, that's that's yeah. wonderful can I use those words? I, I yeah. like, that was a go wonderful combination of words. And, I, and I'm probably going to use your delivery too, because that was an excellent. There delivery. you go. There <laughs> you go. Don't tell yeah. anybody, but I also used to write poetry. Nobody's ever seen it, but it used to happen. All right. Ooh, um, this is going to be a fun, a fun challenge for the chat to try and guess what your, your publishing name or, or username would have been. Oh, 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 oh. My, my wife managed to find my old uh, fanfiction.net account based entirely on the fact that I'm like, yeah, I wrote Lord of the Flies in 1984 fan fiction. And she's like, that's enough that I bet you I could spot it out of the entire archive of what's there. And it took her 10 minutes and she figured out my username. Um, it yeah. is very specific. Yeah. Lord of the Flies in 1984. Yeah. Very specific. Yeah. 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 That's yeah, awesome. This my, yeah, this is my, if you want to challenge the chat to really go at it, give them like one hint to go on and I'll bet you they'll be all over it. <laughs> they'll be all over it. I can see it now. And uh, as Amelie says, yes, they are magic beans. We call them sweet beans. We are a community of, of good good and sweet beans. beans. And uh, yeah, my chat are the magic beans. Oh, but goodbye, oh, I cat. You've decided to go have yeah. you. Um, so uh, yeah, I think that's all of my questions. I think it's time to get to the chat questions. Ooh, so uh, Tillis says, where is Peter lo uh, located and why isn't he sweating to death? 
<laughs> uh, I am in Canada in North Vancouver and uh, it's just like it was a really cold morning this morning like it's been we've had like baking hot weather for the past few days but um I was doing the dog walk this morning and like went back to get a jacket um yeah and that is why I'm wearing something fleece lined but I'm not actively boiling um no, but yeah it's, it's it's just an unusual day also like I love this jacket to death so any anytime the weather is like cool enough that I get to wear it even in summer I, I jump it I just yeah there's uh my um my wife has like a huge crush crush on Milo Ventimiglia and especially him playing Jess on Gilmore Girls um and so when my when my mom was like picking up Christmas gifts this year and asked my wife like what, what do you think Peter would want she's like I think he wants a fleece lined denim jacket <laughs> And I did, but it works out for both of us. <laughs> yeah, the gift that works for everyone. Yeah, yeah. World Keymaster asks, how much does this randomness cost? And can we get it in Northern U Europe? Obviously, shipping for, for we over in Europe is uh, kind of a pain in the butt. So, yeah. uh, yes. So for the Kickstarter, we are going to do regional shipping hubs. So we're going to have a, a German shipping hub um, for to, to go to the rest of Europe. Um, uh, so there's estimates for what the shipping's going to cost on like the main campaign page if you scroll down a bit. Um, and uh, I think so the the I don't know the euro Canadian conversion count right now, but I believe it's I think that the base deck is 42 Canadian dollars, which is probably somewhere between like probably 30 ish euros 30 to 32. Um, I'm not I'm not known for my math skills. Um, it's okay. Google can convert for you. Yeah, check out the conversions on Google guys. Yeah. And, uh, and I think Kickstarter now does it automatically, which was a nice, a nice addition. But um, yeah, and so that's for like the the, the base deck of Deck of Worlds is um, uh, 240 cards. Um, there's also you can get PDFs. Um, the, the PDFs I try to make really accessible. Um, if you're an educator, um, something that I, I, I love using um, creativity tools in the classroom, or rather I love that creativity tools get used in the classroom. And I know that like I've gotten to where I am in my career because of like just having had cool teachers that wanted to teach me different ways to create and and gave me a lot of tools in my toolkit so uh the story engine deck you can download for free for a print and play if you're an educator um you, you just go to storyenginedeck.com demo and if you select educator it'll upgrade you to like the full deck uh for free and we made a, a very easy to print in the classroom version where the cards are a little bit smaller and they're uh the the final production version is like full color backgrounds but this one has white backgrounds with colored text and uh, there's icons for colorblind users so it's meant to be super accessible easy to print use in the classroom dive in and have fun. Um, and there's a lesson plan suite too. Um, so um, uh, yeah, there's a free a free version for educators and the in-between spot is there's a free demo of like a third of the Story Engine deck you can download right now off the website. Again, at storyenginedeck.com slash demo if you want to like just try it out and see how you like it. Um, and uh, yeah, but there's a bunch of options for picking it up. But um, the, the production version is going to be really, really pretty. Like it, we're using the same style of the, of like treasure box as story engine deck. Oh, nice. Um, so it's gonna have this, it's gonna be a little bit taller because there's more cards um, and uh, and it's gonna have like the full down play surface. So like there's definitely, I, I am a big fan of like, just if you wanna get one thing, get the base deck, um, but um, yeah, lots of options. And I try to keep it as accessible as possible because I, I like the creative tools getting out there. I like people using them. That's really cool. Uh, we were just talking about this earlier. Um, I got my start in D&D in a classroom. We did it as an after school activity. These kinds of things are so great for kids. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, speaking of which guys, we would never say you have to go buy something. Obviously, like take a look, see if it's for you. But we have bought the whole thing. We're very excited. <laughs> we can't wait for it to get here. <laughs> So yeah, we're very excited. We'll have it back here on the bookshelf of uh, joy and wondrous things. So uh, yeah, when it arrives, we'll showcase it proudly. We'll show show it to you and uh, yeah, give you our feedback. I'm sure it will be good because uh, yeah, it looks really, really exciting. Um, there's a question here from Sanford Sanderfell, Sanderfell, yes, who says, what is your advice for those stuck in the building part who can't begin the story? So they're stuck with the world building they can't get to their story yet. Yeah, so I mean, there's definitely a difference between setting and story and um, setting is a place that story happens, but it's, it's not the same thing. What I would look at are, um, what look at the ingredients you've built. Um, look at the sort of assumptions that go into how the world operates. So if, if, if your world is, the, let's use the dragon tea one as an example. Um, if, if, it, if the world is built on dragons and tea, then look at what happens when either the, the assumptions are challenged or when the ingredients that you've set up, something goes wrong with them. So let's imagine there's like um, a blight 
that happens that starts to like kill the tea plants, or there's a, a change to the soil consistency that makes it harder to grow, or there's a shortage. Those are all problems that will create a space for story to happen, um, and that will use the ingredients you've already established as like the the, the starting point for that. And so that way, the uh, the conflict will feel organic to your world. It'll have grown directly out of something that you've created. Um, and uh, and it'll still be interesting as a conflict. Like to me, story begins and ends with conflict. Um, and so look look at where those conflicts are, and uh, and the the closer you can tie that to either the the physical things or the uh, cultural values that are important to your world, the better. Like one of my favorite things to ask when I either have like a batch of characters that I like but I don't know what to do with them, or I have a bunch of cultures that I like but I don't know what to do with them, is like what would they disagree on? Um, what's what is an issue that might drive a wedge? Um, because that's where you get really interesting conflict, and it's also where you get to ask and present possible answers to really interesting questions. Um, so like. Let's imagine uh, you have two. Let's imagine in like the dragon world, we have the the ant dwarves and we have the dragons. Um, they'd have really different relationships to nature, probably, because the dwarves are like physically tied to it because they're they're kind of like trees, um, and the dragons depend on uh, on on like viable growth for um, their teas. But one of those is like a consumer relationship. The dragons are consuming nature, um, and the other one is a like. No, the dwarves like in my in my mind, if they're made of tree roots or whatever, and they have moss beards, they literally grow out of the ground. So this is life or death for them. Um, and this is reminiscent of many conflicts in the world today, where some people treat a, a conflict or a um, a threat as a an academic exercise to them, and they're debating um, whether or not this is a real thing to consider. Whereas other people who are directly being affected by the issue are are it's it is life or death for them. Um, yeah. that's a really interesting way to have two different. Uh, Two different points of view to come at a conflict with, um, and to explore which ones you think are are the most important to discuss or have the most pressing questions or answers to give. So, in this case, yeah, it's life or death for the dwarves, and for the dragons, it's like, well, it's my morning tea. Um, how do the dwarves convince the dragons that climate change that is making it harder to grow tea and that is threatening their lives and their growth? How do they con convince them that this is a real issue that is not just academic and it's not just that maybe there's a disruption in your tea service? Um, how, how do they get them to take it seriously and to go joint on this? And that's how they'd solve the problem. So like, that's a for instance, but yeah, look at look at the building blocks of your world and look at what happens if there's a crack in one of those building blocks, if something goes wrong, if there's a disagreement and you can spin a lot out from that would be my, my suggestion. Yeah, absolutely. And then the, the next question of course is, who is the most interesting person to tell this story? Who has the highest stakes? Yes. Uh, probably that would be your main character. And yeah. then of course, the question is how big do you want this story? Do you want it to be about a single dwarf who is encountering a problem, who is encountering loss? Is this a personal story where they encounter and deal with the loss of somebody to the tea dragons? Or is this a, a more epic scale story where the spokesperson of the dwarves has to make it across the journey to actually even get to the dragon. And then they have to find out how to communicate because the dragons don't speak Dwent. Of course they yeah. don't, they speak Dwent. So do you see what I mean? Once you've decided the conflict and you've decided the kind of story you want to tell, then you're going to have a lot of information about who has the high stakes, who should be telling the story, which POVs should be you be digging into. There's your book, right? Like yeah, that's where that, it comes from. That's a series. Down. That book one yeah. is getting to the dragons. Book two is is communicate. I love that. Oh man. Yeah, I this is Lord of the Dwents, guys. We could do yeah. this. Yeah. Um, but I mean, this this is where it comes from. Uh, if you have filled in your meta, go look at the world drama section. That is the big drama in your world, the big current affairs. And you don't have to deal directly with one of those big ones if they're too big. You can find a secondary or tertiary problem from a world affair. If one of your world dramas is the world is heating up, then let's think what that does to agriculture and let's think what that does to societies. And then you might have the conflict that you want to deal with. Not the world's heating up, which is too big and intangible, but something we can control, right? Something that yeah. people can change and have agency and, and, and move the story forward. Uh, that's, where the, that's, that's where the book is, right? It's not the whole world. It's just that little slice of that little story that you want to tell. And sometimes that little story goes over a whole region, and sometimes it's just in one settlement. And that's kind of up to you. Love it. Yeah. 
that's so that's, how, that's where the stories come from. Uh, have you heard of Metaphor Dice, asks ECC Books. As a poet, he might find them a neat game slash tool. I have not heard of Metaphor Dice, and it's I don't want to Google while I'm on stream, but I, I would desperately want to know more about it, so I'll probably Google the moment we, we are offline, but that sounds really cool. <laughs> I'm doing my Google foo right now. All right. Uh, <laughs> Okay, they are exactly as they sound, and they look really, really fun. Really cool. Thank you for that tip, ECC. Uh, ECC Books dice. is um, a writing professor. So, oh, very yeah, cool. He knows all the best tools. Yeah. ECC Books, if you have more recommendations for cool tools, let yeah. me know. He's he's already been saying, oh my gosh, I have to get the educators version of this, the print and play, and share it with my students. So, yes, yes, yeah. please do. Um, let's have a look. We are almost at time, but I think we have time for one more question. This one from Krehera. What is your personal favorite type of story that has come out of your tools? Hmm. Well, so recently um, uh, I was doing like, I was just trying to literally catch uh, a bit of the golden hour for like a photographing a prompt um, uh, while my wife was gardening and just the light was hitting right. And I like ran out and took a picture in like the back alley behind our house with some nice bushes behind it. And I was really just trying to do it for like for the gram, so to speak. Um, but uh, uh, I created a micro setting and there was one part of it that just gave me a really haunting, fascinating image that like has been in my head for two days now. And that I think is gonna end up in a story at some point. Um, and that was, I drew um, uh, a landmark card, which was Arena. Um, and then I drew um, what probably my favorite deck in Deck of Worlds is the, the namesake deck. Um, this actually creates like nicknames that have a sense of in-world lore to them that you combine with regions or landmark cards. You could have like the Refugees Basin or um, the Basin that Sleeps um, and, uh, and you create these different combinations. And I ended up with um, the Arena of Chimes. And for some reason, like the name stuck. I'm like, that just sounds like a cool name. And I wanna figure out why it's called that. Um, and then I drew um, an origin card, which gives like a backstory to the, the space. And uh, the card that I drew gave me that it was the site of a famous performance. Um, and for some reason, I started thinking of this arena where like all of the rafters of it, of this huge space are just hanging with bones, bone chimes. And whenever the wind comes through, you hear this gentle clanking of like thousands of dead of all sort of the fallen who didn't win. Um, and I started imagining, okay, well, what's this performance? And uh, maybe there's a section of bones, which is all from like this one massive fight that happened that has been like at the center of the lore for this like just absolutely ghastly arena. Um, and that has been in my head for two days straight. Um, so in terms of like favorite things that have grown out of it, right now that's that's mine just because it's like, it's it's something, it's, it's embedded in my skull for reasons that I don't fully understand. But uh, that one was, it was a case where I almost ignored the rest of the prompt because that those were the ingredients that were just like, absolutely talking to me yeah i i love that that's that's wonderful thank you so much for sharing that thank you and uh i think that is all we have time for so peter thank you so very much for joining us today thank you this was so much fun it was great and uh, demetrius story said we already said we would love to have you back to talk more about um uh, well, all sorts of things. Uh, randomness, of course, is what we talked about today, but uh, you are a man with many specialisms and you have a lot of interest. So uh, what do you think? Would you be up for it? Oh yeah, for sure. I, you, can, you can't shut me up once you start me babbling. So yeah, please bring, bring me back. I'd love, to, I'd love to keep chatting. That makes you the perfect podcast guest. Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> all right. I would like to thank you, beautiful beans. Thank you so much for being here with your wonderful questions, with your hilarious banter about the tea dragons. I feel like you've really created something wonderful there. Congratulations to Evan Arix, who won the raffle. Please email me at hello at worldamble.com. I will do the email foo and we will get all the all the details in all the places and make sure that you get your thing. I would also like to thank There we go, for the subs, Krahira, the Bearded Heathen, um, Akimotos, Jacob, Vox New Pop, and Miller Darman. For the bits, Mergendor and Extremcy. Thank you everyone who followed us today and everyone who hosted. We are going on our raid. Our raid shout is light up the forge. So shout it out when you get to Patrick Rothfuss to let him know that we sent you. We will be back tomorrow 
with a very, very special stream. We are doing a marathon. It is CowCon 2, how to create kick-ass campaigns, aka how not to be boring. And we will be talking about how to plan without planning, how to make the best possible dungeon maps to enthrall your players, how to get your players engaged in your game. That's our one. Oh yeah. And how to make fantastical maps, whatever genre you are digging into. So don't miss that. We'll see you tomorrow with that. In the meantime, have a happy raid, grab your hammer, and go world build. <laughs>